Hi, everyone. This is Rajivan Jung from PhD Expertise. And today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Dr. Byron George. Byron finished his undergrad in chemical engineering from Louisiana State University. He went on to do his PhD in chemical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology, where we were lab mates. And he eventually Georgia Tech in pursuit of maybe a non-researcher type of path. He, he went on to McKinsey and Company, where he has had uh, what we feel like is much success. He's still there. And his current role is manager of professional development at McKinsey within one of their practices. So we're super excited to have him on. Thank you, Byron, for joining us today. Really excited to be here, guys. Really excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So we have a whole slate of questions for you, Byron. And we are, you know, a lot of these questions are sort of geared at where you are at right now, but that that whole context that you can bring, um, that's super valuable. So we'd love just to get any insights that you have along the way, if you think of other things you want to talk through. So you completed your PhD at Tech. And then what I noticed, at least, is you were very active in extracurricular activities, particularly around leadership, mentorship, service. So how did you go about recognizing that type of work was something that you were interested in? And second, how do you recommend other students identify the type of activities and non-research interests that they might have that might help them in their guiding their careers? Yeah, John, what, what Raj just want to tell you is that he said he noticed that I was so active in other things, which, which means like he didn't see me in lab and I was always somewhere <laughs> else doing other things. So that's the more honest uh, portrayal, but he, he made it sound a whole lot better. Um, you know, to be honest, I wish it was as strategic as it kind of turned out in the end in terms of like what led me to doing that and being involved in a lot of other things. But to be honest, at the core of it, it was just I needed things that gave me energy and, and gave me passion to give me the fuel to, to keep doing what I was doing with my PhD. Because as you guys know, in the PhD process, it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions and energy. And sometimes you just got to find things that like give you an opportunity to express yourself in maybe a different way or be around people, be connected. And so it, it was really about finding community. And through that, I was able to find opportunities to give back. So a lot of it was mentoring programs for, say, undergrads or high school students. Um, then I naturally just found my way into leadership positions just because of the experiences that I was able to have and things I was able to share. And so I kind of just took that approach and that's actually evolved in how I, you know, find things that I'm passionate about in my consulting career outside of my day job, you know, things that I build on an entrepreneurial standpoint. The same way is just just find what you're passionate about and don't don't relegate yourself to one identity. I think that's one of the biggest things that the PhD process does a disservice to us is it, it puts us in this funnel of what our identity is that I, I am just a PhD student. My, my whole energy, my whole time needs to go towards being in lab and publishing and writing articles and all these other things. When you have so many things that I'm sure make you that give you interest, whether it's physical activity, different, you know, things happening in the world that you're passionate about. So find ways, even in small scale, to be able to express that and maybe find others that you can express that with. So similar to what you guys are doing right here with PhD expertise. Yeah, no, awesome. And that totally makes sense. And Byron, I would never imply that you weren't in the lab. Okay. So let me, let's not, <laughs> it's all right. let's, I'm let's very, I'm very, I'm very, you know, helpful way in terms of my PhD process. Well, what, one of the things that I did notice about Byron is that he was so engaged and motivated by these things, right? And it totally it aligned with his career interest. And, and, and as he's talking through these things, we'll, we'll be able to see that. But one of the other things that you know you did was you obtained a management minor. And I think to some extent that might have helped you figure out the, the next step that you were going to be able to take in your career and that, that interest in management consulting. Can you talk a little bit about that process, but also just the general activities that you you took the the preparation that you did to successfully obtain an offer from McKinsey and Company. For sure, for sure. The way I think about it is not so much I did the management degree because I knew I wanted to do management consulting. It was more so I gravitated towards the management minor uh, because it was an opportunity to, to do a different type of problem solving than I think the academic process allows you to. As you guys know, doing your PhD is a very in-depth, very detailed, but a very narrow scope and like probably a long tail of actual impact slash results that you get. With business, you can actually engage fairly quickly and start to see like the response of the results at a quicker pace, right? And so that, I think I gravitated to that. I thought the types of conversations I was having in my management classes just fit the way I, my brain worked and the way I thought about things. And it was able, I was able to expand that. And so um, I actually found out about management consulting kind of through that network of people that I was taking these classes uh, with. It was through the business school at Georgia Tech. So 
it was a bit serendipitous of how I landed in management consulting, but I think at the, the core of it, it was like understanding that the way that I liked to create impact. And even through my consulting career, I, like I've kind of refined, I continue to like refine that question of like, yes, I have, we all have all these skills and things that we can do, but what's, what's the skill set that we love to do and that we're natural at? And so like, how do we like triple down on that and become, you know, known for it versus feeling like we have to do a lot of things that aren't, don't, don't necessarily come natural to us. So I think that's really what the biggest benefit of the management. It seems like you recognize that, right? And you, you were able to connect with people who had a common interest and then, but there was another element to it, right? There was a whole preparation that you did to yeah. be able to get that offer. So what, what was that like? And can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. I, I mean, it was, uh, I don't know for, for folks that are familiar with the management consulting process, the interview process is, is fairly involved. You know, you have to go through what we call case interviews. So there's a bit of practice, a bit of learning, especially if you're coming from where I was in terms of my understanding of business. Like I didn't even know what profit really meant when I got excited about joining a management consulting firm. And so thankfully I was, you know, I had the community that I built through the like through my management minor. And so that made it more fun, right? As the learning of it, the practicing of the cases, um, it was a lot of just like, you know, watching prep materials like videos, uh, case books, but mostly it was about practice. So it would be uh, when I was on campus, meet up with friends when we had downtime. And as Raj knows, I created a lot of downtime for myself at times in my <laughs> PhD career um, or on the weekends. Right. Just going to a coffee shop and just doing rounds of, of case interviews. And it was fun because the, the practice itself was actually invigorating. Right. And so that was important. That was an indication for me of like, OK, if this is if this is what the prep preparation looks like, then maybe I'll actually enjoy the job, which actually turned out to be the truth. Yeah, yeah. And would you talk a little bit, it's super interesting you're bringing all that up. Would you talk a little bit about like the actual, the interviews and your feelings around the interviews and how you came out of them and, you know, just yeah, yeah. Rec recollection around that. That'd just be interesting to hear. Oh, man. And, and Raj, I'm sure you could, you probably have told your story already. Um, it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? It's a management of, of emotions <laughs> at the highest level, right? So you have the excitement of the preparation that you put in, the topic, the, the the types of conversations you're able to have with established management consultants, some of them partner level. And then you have the immense anxiety of like your future or what you aspire to is tied to this one conversation or this one math problem. Like you, you, you never, you never realize how quickly you can forget, forget how to do long division whenever like you feel like your, your livelihood is on the line. So, um, I, 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 <laughs> I always tell Raj, like I, I definitely went through the roller coaster of emotions, uh, the, the height of, of excitement of getting to the next round to having a delay in the response and in finding myself in the fetal position, you know, praying for something <laughs> from the heaven. So, um, it's definitely, it definitely taught me about one, how to, how to manage my expectations, but also like hope for the best and plan for the best. Yeah. That's quite interesting to hear. And I know you have been an associate and manager at McKinsey and company for the past five plus years. What kind of skills do you believe are required or most useful for people who can be successful in uh, those roles advancing their careers? And also what kind of type of works are you focusing on right now, especially in the age of uh, remote working? Yeah, uh, man, that's a that's a that's a loaded question. We could talk about that all day. I'll start with the with the skill set and, and thinking about one. What are the what are the type of skills that kind of get you interested slash into consulting? And then what are the what's the disposition that allows you to get the most out of the experience? Right. And there's going to be similarities between the two. I think one thing I noticed about most people that find themselves in this space is they're naturally curious you know, like people that like have a lot of interest and like to be able to dive deep into different topics, whether it's something that they never heard before or something that they have a lot, a lot of expertise in. Right. And so that usually translates into people building various levels of expertise, uh, various types of, you know, uh, skills that they can bring to th anything that they're passionate about. Um, once you're kind of in the door and, you, you, and you've shown your like your chops of what we call problem solving, which is just what's your ability to structure a problem, what's your ability to work through it, you know, either conceptually or analytically, and then be able to concisely communicate results and actions for whoever it is that you're trying to help, right? Which is what you do in the in the PhD process, maybe just over a longer time horizon, right? But one thing that I noticed, like once you're in uh, and you're going through building your skill set, like which is what we call the toolkit of being an associate and engagement manager. There's a lot of transferable skills in there. There's things like 
comfort with communication and being concise and being structured in your thinking, the ability to do analysis or have a feel for analysis and numbers, right? And like in a way to do, do it in an efficient way. And so once you've developed those toolkits or those skill sets early in your career, then it becomes about where do you want to apply this expertise? Like what is the problems? What are the core problems that you're really excited about? Whether it's public sector or it's a specific industry like telecom or oil and gas or whatever it is that you find passionate and how you bring that skill set or that functional skill set to that industry. And that's really when you start to kind of take on more of an entrepreneurial angle in your career. I always tell people a consulting career is like you're just your own startup and you're within the infrastructure that's like that works like the free market of building your brand, building your expertise and, and hoping to scale from there. The second part of the question, what type of work are you focusing now? <laughs> so for myself, like I'm, I'm in a beautiful place of life of um, have, being able to dissolve some of the constructs or, or, or concepts that make me feel like I have to do one thing within a specific role. I'd say across all the things I do, both my, my role at McKinsey as a manager of professional development and executive coach, my private executive coaching and then being a general partner of a venture capitalist firm, across all those things, it's really just connecting with people helping them realize what their vision is and then like guiding them and facilitating their growth or the skill sets that they need to develop within that. Right. And so the way that looks is in my McKinsey career, I developed an expertise in the organization practice, which is really about all things people. Like when I go into my clients, it's about how are you structuring your organization? What's your leadership development uh, process? You know, what are the different incentives that you have? Like, how do you understand your people? And I've been able to do that at a one-on-one -on -one at the highest level with executives, right? So talking with C-suite uh, leaders about what their leadership philosophy is and helping them navigate their own insecurities or their visions and fears to help one, improve themselves, but also improve their organizations, right? And so I'm able to do that across what my what I serve in my clients, uh, the, the junior partners and partners that I, that I cover and serve uh, within McKinsey, but also for other things that I'm passionate about, which is, you know, black and brown startup founders and helping them have some of the same resources that I'm bringing to the, these uh, C-suite clients and helping them protect their value and also be able to scale the business and the vision that they have for what they're trying to build. A couple of follow-ups there, Byron. So the first follow-up is around your experience at McKinsey and literally what really important things I think people have in the back of their mind. What are the true core tools that are being used? Like for instance, um, yeah. is it Excel and PowerPoint? Are those things that people need to focus on? Or what areas do you think that people naturally need to focus on coming out of a PhD? That might be a yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so if I think about the biggest thing that I had to transition from the academic world to consulting, it's really about taking my ability to structure problems, which you, I know most PhD students do, do develop over their career and learning how to do that at a quicker pace and, at, and, like, and across various different types of problems, right? So the things like PowerPoint and Excel, like, yes, they, it would be great if you had some of those skills, but you also learn those on the job, right? The biggest thing is like the shifting of the mindset from I'm here to create as much impact in a very efficient and kind of quicker pace. And so it's more so like, how do I, what's the 20% of effort that I need to put in to get the, you know, the majority of impact or like the quickest level of impact. And that's a, it's a bit of a mindset shift that I, I know a lot of PhD students uh, can struggle with when they do go to consulting. So the way to practice that really is just cases and understanding, okay, like there may, they, there may not be one right answer, but like, how do I develop my skill set to, to where I feel very confident in how I've structured this problem, but also this approach. And I think that this can actually lead to a result that's, you know, actually impactful. Um, one other thing I'll say is that uh, consulting is far more collaborative than I think the PhD process is. So you're, ne you're never solving problems in silo. You're solving problems with a team. So it requires things like communicating what your current thinking is and getting feedback from either the leaders that you're working with or your other teammates or your clients, right? So it's, that's it. that usually takes a little bit of getting used to as well. So as much as you can kind of practice that, even in your PhD process of like having more structured communication with your PI or coordinating with the undergraduates in your lab so you can have a little bit of that collaboration feel of like, yes, let's problem solve this together. Like, I think that's, uh, those are great ways that you can prepare yourself for what the environment consulting is like. Okay, and the second follow up to that, it's sort of the, the back half of what you talked about. You have taken your McKinsey core skill set right, and you're now trying to apply it outside of McKinsey, right? And, and you talked a little bit about minority owned businesses and these type of things bringing scale to them. Can you talk to how you recognizing that you wanted to do something like this, that you had the capabilities to do it? Because if you think about it, right, 
thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur, you're like, oh, I need a lot of capital to do something. Oh, I don't have the toolkit to be able to handle it. What was your thought process like there? And how did you come to this conclusion that this is the right place for you to be able to add value? I, I truly honestly think I was a benefit of the consulting like structure slash process because the way consulting works is you're bouncing from client to client every six weeks to, you know, three months, right? So you, you get to see a lot of different reps fairly quickly and you, you start to learn this like, oh, wow, I can make impact in a lot of different spaces, even if I didn't have the expertise going in. Yeah. So, you know, two, two years into my career, when I'm going into a whole new industry, but I'm being able to solve problems by analogy, it's like, oh, wow, I'm not just an engineer or I'm not just a chemical engineer or I'm not just a PhD student. I'm just a problem solver. Like I can help add value in a lot of different ways if I can just get up to speed, you know, in, a, in an amount of time to actually add, that, to add impact, right? And so that that kind of freed me to like, okay, let me start asking questions outside of just the, the structure of McKinsey itself, you know, because it, it can be just like how we treat academia. It's like, okay, I did my undergrad degree. Now I'm going to get my PhD. Now I'm going to be an engineer versus, you know, the roles are just, Roles are, are lagging indicators, as I like to call it. Like you, if you do something that you love and you're good at it and it creates value, you can call me the janitor for all I care, right? Like that's all my end result is like, I just want to do the thing that I'm really passionate about. And thankfully consulting gives you that like that breadth of being able to bounce around and and really uh, understand that you can you can build what you're passionate about. And so I just took that one degree further outside of the firm when it was really like, okay, I have all these resources that my community isn't really getting access to. Even within, even my even my firm wasn't really focused on like that scale of, of, of founders. So I was like, in a short amount of time or a, uh, you know, a, a limited capacity, I can add a lot of value just by bringing some of the things that I take for granted with my clients to people that don't get access to that type of advisory services, right? And so it's similar to how you, you, know, you didn't see me in a lab because I was doing something else on the side. It's a little bit of that same pattern of like, Find, they develop the skill sets that you that you love and then just bring them to the areas that you're passionate about similar to what you guys are doing with phd expertise right no one's no one's forcing you to do this this isn't a part of your job it's just you you all have a great skill and a gift that you want to bring to the people and the topics that you're passionate about and one last question and you already kind of gave a lot of answer touched on this but a lot of our audience is current phd students thinking about their next moves would you give one or two more pieces of advice and lessons learned on pursuing management consulting after uh, their PhDs? I'd take it one step back from just pursuing management consulting. I'd say open the aperture as much as possible. You are not just a PhD student. You are not just an engineer or insert science or whatever you're studying, right? You are a dynamic person who is extremely intelligent and can work in ambiguity and create structure and impact, right? That's how you would decide, describe any CEO, any leader in any organization, any, any politician, right? So really take the time to think about what am I passionate about and how do I find myself in a, an opportunity to take what I, the skills that I've developed and go hone that craft and also make the impact in the spaces that, that I'm passionate about. If you do decide that management consulting is the way you want to go, I think it is a great next step for PhD students that want to say, open the aperture a bit in the ways that, that they serve. I would start to just, you know, reach out to people that you know, that are in the industry that have, have gone through that experience. And then do your research, your diligence on like the preparation, right? And maybe start to get to dabble in, reading a few books in here, here and there, watching some videos on case interviewing, just so you can get a feel for like, okay, this seems interesting. If you have that instinct inside of you, like, oh, okay, I could actually like, I get excited with this. And that's a good indication that it may be something that you would one, be good at, and also would really enjoy learning like continuously throughout your career. And uh, Varun, we really appreciate you being with us today. And thanks to everyone for watching this. And if you have any questions for Byron, please send them to phdexpertiseteam at gmail.com and stay tuned for our next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it, fellas.